Unlike most animals, plants are capable of propagating a new generation of their species without seed. That is, they are capable of asexual reproduction. Like human beings and animals, plants can also reproduce sexually to produce seeds that give rise to a new generation. In this lesson, you will learn about sexual reproduction in flowering plants. At the end of this lesson, you will be able to Identify the importance of sexual reproduction List the reproductive parts in flowering plants Explain the steps involved in the process of sexual reproduction in flowering plants and explain the concept of germination. Arnold has been learning about the world of plants through his mom's garden. They have had some interesting discussions about asexual reproduction in plants. It's another sunny day and he is back in his favorite place the garden in the backyard. Let's see what mysteries he unfolds today. Wow! Look at those hibiscus flowers. Beautiful! Hey mom! I've got some yellow stuff on my fingers. That must be pollen from the flowers. You remember I was telling you that it is the sexual mode of reproduction found in the hibiscus. Pollen is a coarse powder that carries the male gamete of the seed plants to the female part of the flower. You know, I was reading up about reproduction in plants and I came across some interesting stuff. Considering that many plants reproduce asexually as well, I wonder why sexual reproduction is required at all. What advantages does it provide over asexual reproduction? Well, asexual reproduction does not always provide enough DNA variation for the survival of a species. You may remember that chromosomes in the nucleus of a cell contain information for inheritance of features from parents to the next generation in the form of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid molecules. A basic event in reproduction is the creation of a DNA copy. Cells use chemical reactions to build copies of their DNA. Oh, I guess that's why children resemble their parents. Correct. In the process of copying the DNA, variations are produced. Sexual reproduction provides greater DNA variations. Hence, the offsprings produced through sexual reproduction are better suited for survival and provide a mechanism for selective adaptation to occur. For example, over generations, short-necked giraffes evolved to long-necked giraffes because their food was available only high up on the trees. Offsprings produced through sexual reproduction may be less susceptible to certain diseases. For example, tomatoes may gain resistance to bacterial diseases over generations through sexual reproduction. Did that sound complicated? Let me explain further. Organisms that reproduce asexually tend to multiply quickly. However, 
they rely on mutation for variations in their DNA. Therefore, all members of the species have similar vulnerabilities. In fact, some organisms may be unable to reproduce further when their nuclei become weak due to repeated asexual reproduction. For example, paramecium, which can reproduce by binary fission, can face this problem. On the other hand, organisms that reproduce sexually yield a smaller number of offspring. But these offspring have greater DNA variations. Why is that? The new individual or the offspring derives half the amount of DNA from the female gamete and the other half from the male gamete. Thus, sexual reproduction ensures a mixing of the gene pool of the species and due to genetic recombination during meiosis, greater variations occur. DNA variations do not occur in the asexual method due to the lack of the gamete formation. This is what makes them more suited for survival in adverse conditions. For example, your dad has diabetes, but I don't. So, you only have 50% chance of inheriting the disease from him. Now, let's look at how the mixing of the gene pool occurs in flowering plants or angiosperms. In flowering plants, the reproductive parts of these plants are located in the flower. A flower comprises of sepals, petals, stamen, and carpels. Stamens and the carpels are the reproductive parts of a flower which contain germ cells. Germ cells help in reproduction. So, every flower has stamens as well as carpels? Not necessarily. Flowers can be bisexual as well as unisexual. A unisexual flower contains either stamens or carpels. For example, papaya and watermelon are unisexual flowers. A bisexual flower is one which contains stamens as well as carpels. For example, hibiscus and mustard flowers are bisexual. So how do the male and female germ cells come together to form the embryo? Let's use the hibiscus flower to understand the process. This is the stamen, the male reproductive part of a flower. It consists of the filament and anther. The filament is the stalk of the anther. The anther produces yellowish pollen grains from the pollen sacs inside it. That's the yellow stuff that you got on your hands when you touched the flower. In the same way, when an anther brushes against an insect, say a butterfly, some pollen grains stick to the insect. For fertilization, these pollen grains need to be transferred to a stigma. This process of transfer of pollen grains from the anther to the stigma is known as pollination. Stigma of the same flower or a different flower? Well, 
In bisexual flowers, it could happen both ways. If this transfer of pollen occurs in the same flower, it is referred to as self-pollination. On the other hand, if the pollen is transferred from one flower to another, it is known as cross-pollination. So how exactly does pollen reach the female reproductive part of another flower? Through agents like wind, water, animals, birds, insects, and of course, human beings. Ah, human beings like me? Ha, ah, yes. You could be an agent too. See that butterfly sitting on the flower? Butterflies often take these pollen grains to the female reproductive part or the carpel of another flower. You know, I was wondering what exactly attracts agents like the butterfly to these flowers. I read up a bit and this is what I found. We spoke about petals earlier, remember? Petals function to attract insects or bird pollinators through color, scent and nectar, which may be secreted in some part of the flower. For example, hibiscus petals use vibrant colors as well as nectar to attract pollinating agents such as hummingbirds. Flowers pollinated by night visitors such as bats or moths are likely to concentrate on scent, which can attract pollinators in the dark rather than color. Most flowers with such a scent are white. In fact, the characteristics that attract pollinators account for the popularity of flowers and flowering plants among humans. Now let's get back to the female reproductive part of the flower. A carpel is located in the center of a flower and comprises of three parts. The ovary, the style and the stigma. Let's look at the carpel closely. The terminal part is the stigma. Try touching this stigma. It's a little sticky, isn't it? True. Can you guess why it needs to be sticky? Oh, to catch the pollen grains, of course. That's right. When the butterfly carries the pollen grains from the stamen, the stigma can trap these pollen grains in its sticky surface. Then they can travel down to the ovary for fertilization. So the middle elongated part of the carpel is the style and this swollen part at the bottom is the ovary? Yes, you got it. Now let's look at the ovary. The ovary contains ovules and each ovule has an egg cell. Now that the stigma of the hibiscus flower has received pollen grains, these grains have to reach the female germ cells which are in the ovary. So, do the pollen grains just fall through the style to reach the ovary? Not quite. To enable the pollen grains to reach the female germ cells, a tube grows out of the pollen grain and reaches the ovary. This tube is known as the pollen tube. This is where the fusion of the germ cells or fertilization takes place. During fertilization, the male germ cell produced by pollen grain fuses with the female germ cell 
present in the ovule. This fusion of two gametes or germ cells is also called syngamy. Syngamy produces a zygote which is capable of growing into a new plant. So then the seeds that we see are zygotes. Not so fast. After fertilization, the zygote divides several times to form an embryo within the ovule. The ovule then develops a tough coat and is gradually converted into a seed. These are the seeds that we use to raise new plants. But the seed is not available to us just yet. It is enclosed in the ovary that grows rapidly and ripens to form a fruit. In this process, the petals, sepals, stamens, style and stigma may shrivel and fall off. The seed inside the fruit contains the future plant or embryo which develops into a seedling under appropriate conditions. Take a look at this hibiscus plant. Fertilization has taken place and the sepals, petals, stamens, style and stigma have withered away. But the seeds are still alive. Wow! It's become very windy. That's nature's way of dispersing the seeds of a plant. The wind will carry the seeds away and strew them on the ground somewhere else, ready to germinate and form new plants in suitable conditions. Hmm! Suitable conditions for germination, huh? Actually, once the seed is covered by soil, the basic conditions typically required for germination are nutrients, water, oxygen and proper temperature. Germination begins when the seed starts growing. The first phase shows the embryo's cell enlarging. The seed coat then breaks and the main root emerges. This is then followed by the development of the shoot that contains the stem and the leaves. Are you wondering where the zygote gets the energy to break out of the seed and grow? It derives nutrition from the endosperm or the nutritive tissues surrounding the cell. As it is the rainy season, the earth is wet and perfect for cultivation. So, happy gardening! This is the end of our discussion on sexual reproduction in flowering plants. In this lesson, you learnt about the importance of sexual reproduction the reproduction parts of a flower and the process of reproduction in a flowering plant. To revisit the key points covered in this lesson, please review the flashcard at the end of this lesson.